We like to say in English that there's many ways to skin a cat, and there's many ways to split a water molecule or to separate hydrogen from conventional hydrocarbons. The basic principles of electrolyzers have been around for a century. Uh, of course, they've been improving, and I would never want to belittle the progress that has been made. But it seems to me that more than ever before, electrolyzers are now at the core of the debate concerning the future of our energy economy, and it is a huge debate. It's also at the core of the debate about environmental policies. In the following 10 elevator pitches, you will see presentations and you will hear the leaders of this segment of our hydrogen and fuel cell uh, um, stand here. What I'd like to point out at the beginning is that each choice of technology can also be seen as an interpretation of the prospects of the current and future energy resources and their use, as well as their effect upon our environment. These are fundamental issues of human survival. If you believe the market for electrolyzers is largely to supply hydrogen to the industries, you're not that really positive about the future of the fuel cell in other sectors. If you are risking your shirt to develop on-site automotive refueling stations, you're, you've already made a claim about the limited future of combustion engines, or maybe you have a strong opinion about the incidence of cancer in areas with high traffic density. If you don't believe in the re-electrification of renewable hydrogen, you are not only limiting a potentially huge market for development, but you are also showing uh, slowing or even halting the advancement of renewable resources and energy, such as wind and solar, which exist in unlimited quantity but rely on storage technologies. So if you think that putting hydrogen in natural gas grids is a waste of expensive resource, you might also be hindering a transitional phase in our path towards renewable energy economies. I encourage you to listen carefully to the discussion and carefully to the products as they are presented and to listen to the conceptions they offer of the future of our energy economy. In less than an hour, we will return to all these 10 gentlemen and we will let the debate deb begin. And it is a fundamental debate and a fascinating one. I'd like to invite up onto the stage for our first talk, Dr. Graham Cooley, who's CEO of ITM Power. Please welcome with me, Graham Cooley. Thank you very much. Thanks for the introduction. Uh, so can I have the slides on the screen, please? There we are, good. Okay, so five minute elevator pitch uh, about ITM Power. Um, so ITM Power, we're interested in energy storage in the production of clean fuel. Actually, what we make is rapid response, self-pressurizing electrolysis. You can use it to directly couple to renewable power or you can use it to balance the grid as a, as a rapidly dispatchable load. When you make hydrogen, you then put it directly into the gas grid. This is straight energy storage. It's referred to as power to gas energy storage. Or you can store some of the hydrogen and use it in a refueling station to refuel fuel cell electric vehicles. Okay, fuel cell electric vehicles are a, a, a very important technology because they're zero emission and all over the world now we're looking at air quality in inner cities. So a big quick snapshot of the company. Um, this is a slide on our achievements in 2016. Um, I have to say that already in 2017 the numbers are looking even better. So today we have around 25 million of deal flow. Um, the end of 2016, we had 21 million. We did 16 million worth of projects in 2016, which was up 100% from the year before. And one of the key reasons for this is we met the long run EU target for rapid response electrolysis at 1 million euros a megawatt. So that's 1,000 euros a kilowatt. And as a result of that, we sold 5.25 megawatts of equipment in 2016. In fact, already in 2017, we're up to 3.5 megawatts of equipment. Okay, so the industry's moving very quickly.
In terms of refueling stations, we opened three uh, new refueling stations in the UK um, and also in the US, in California. Um, we did our first, announced our first major power to gas project with National Grid in the UK. That's looking at the legislation of putting hydrogen directly into the gas grid in the UK. We already have four such projects in Germany. Uh, we've been signing fuel contracts with major companies who are building up fleets of fuel cell electric vehicles. And we opened our first uh, refueling station on a shell forecourt, actually on the M25 um, in the UK. Um, so I have to thank the FCHJU have been an incredible impetus for the development of hydrogen refueling around the world. We're lucky enough to have four major FCHJU projects in which we're deploying many um, uh, 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 refueling stations, um, hydrogen refueling stations. Uh, we already have four open to the general public. Uh, we have a, a whole host now coming out this year and we're in the development phase for another six or eight more. So um, the UK is becoming a real centre for hydrogen refuelling in the world. Um, the shell, opening of the Shell uh, refuelling station was a very important event in the UK, principally because it's one of the um, ref, uh, petrol stations with the highest throughput of customers. But it's also because we worked on the legislation for putting electrolyzers into, onto petrol forecourts. And in collaboration with Shell and the British Compressed Gas Association and the Energy Institute, we have now changed the blue book in the UK, which means you can deploy hydrogen on forecourts. Uh, we have our first bus refueling station announced. Uh, this is in Birmingham. Uh, the FCHJU have funded 20 buses in Birmingham and Innovate UK have funded a three megawatt electrolyzer as the refueling station. And we've collaborated with Linda, as we do with most of our refueling stations, um, to deploy their compressors and their dispensers. Three megawatts is a key piece of electrolysis equipment because it's three megawatts is the threshold for grid balancing without aggregation. Okay, so we got the first device that we can actually bid directly um, into that industry. For aggregation, uh, we collaborate with Angie, and Angie are the UK's leader for bidding rapid response loads into grid balancing in the UK. So we're in scale up at the moment. You, if you go to our stand, you'll see a two megawatt electrolyzer. It's a two megawatt PEM electrolyzer. It's rapid response and it's high pressure. We, we uh, regularly sell now one megawatt pieces of equipment. We bid up to six or 10 megawatts, and we're looking at modules that will uh, go from the 10 megawatt scale up to the 100 megawatt scale. So we're now talking about refineries, we're talking about chemistry, we're talking about power to gas energy storage. And actually, when you look at power to gas energy storage, the key point about power to gas is it's a way of decarbonizing heat. So what you do when you make hydrogen with, renew with renewable power and you inject it into the gas grid is you produce renewable heat. And heat it is the most e difficult energy vector to decarbonize and a very important application of hydrogen. Um, so this is a, um, a, a schematic of a 10 megawatt design. All of that has genuinely been designed, all the balance of plant, so that it is rapid response and high pressure. I and mean, in fact, we've now looking at quotations all the way up to the 100 megawatt level. So look, let me just summarize. Five minutes is a, a very short amount of time uh, to talk about the company and, and, what you, and, and the market as well. But I would say that we have strong deal flow now. We have that for two reasons. One is we met the cost structures that are required for, for, for the new industries. And the other one is that we are in a very rapidly developing market now with hydrogen, particularly in transport. It's not only cars, it's commercial vehicles, it's buses, trains, 
a very dramatic growth, even over the last year. Thanks very much. So thank you very much. Uh, we move on to the next speaker. Um, he is Siegfried Limmer, Research and Development at Odasco Heliocentrics. He's in the house, Siegfried. Ah, sorry. <laughs> yeah, welcome, Siegfried Limmer. Thank you for the introduction. Hello, everybody, to this session. Um, first, I would like to introduce Odasco. Um, Odasco is an Arabian company with um, branches in Europe, in the Emirates, in Oman, in Kuwait, in Jordan. And Odasco is mainly working on uh, project engineering, uh, procurement and commissioning of large industrial automation projects, renewable energy solutions, and basically also turnkey electrical solutions and telecom infrastructure projects. So Odasco is doing basically all from the engineering until the commissioning of the, of the projects. Odasco at the end of last year bought then Heliocentris or the assets of Heliocentris, a well-known fuel cell company here in, in Germany and Europe and has three additional branches now, which is Odasco Helio Centers Industries, which is bringing mainly uh, energy management systems to the, to the scope of Odasco. Um, then Odasco Helio Centers Fuel Cell Systems, based here also in Germany, which is bringing in fuel cell competency on, in terms of backup power solutions and Odasco Heliocentris Italy, which is um, developing and producing electrolyzer, which I'm going to talk about now. Um, the electrolyzer from, from Odasco Heliocentris Italy are basically merging the technology from PEM and alkaline electrolyzers by using an anion exchange membrane um, where, which is used um, and not, uh, not a solution. This leads to a very simple and low cost electrolyzer system. And in order to highlight that, basically, basically we are working on a hydrogen pressure level of 35 bars um, due to the alkaline uh, electrolyzer we can have low cost catalysts um, um, the alkaline membrane technology offers also the potential to work on very low uh, concentrations of alkaline solutions so what we offer to the market in that with that technology is basically the whole range, starting from the stacks. And we are coming from a different power level than my, uh, the previous speaker from ITM. So we are coming from the lower edge of the, of the, of the power level. So we are, we are doing stacks in, uh, up to 500 uh, normally to per, per hour. So, so this is the, the lower scale of the, uh, of the technology. Um, the stacks work at hydrogen pressures up to 35 bars, um, and depending on the size of the stacks, up to 38 volts. Um, we also offer to the market uh, complete modules uh, where you can integrate them into your systems. Um, the products range there from, from 250 liter per hour up to one cubic meter, uh, one cubic meter per hour AC powered systems, which are incorporated into 19 inch modules and you can incorporate them into your, into your systems or into your applications which you have. Um, 
We also do um, complete electrolyzer systems um, in the in the in the range of one cubic meter and upscaling with additional. So they are they are upscalable and modular, so that you can can go into the tens of cubic meter in terms of uh, production rate of of hydrogen. And there we go. Basically, we are looking at the markets where we go into the also for the on-site hydrogen production. We are we are going into the laboratory use of hydrogen for analyzers, uh, gas chromatography or um, applications like that. Uh, we do um, for meteorological uh, stations where we, where we can blow up balloons or go into the industry, for example, um, um, generator cooling where we are, where we, where we deliver systems up to 10 to 20 cubic meters. The next application uh, where we specially look into is the industrial on-site energy storage, um, where, we, where we look into emergency power, complementary power, and autonomous power solutions, um, where we can store the hydrogen and reuse it within fuel cells um, whenever it's needed. Um, the last part of, the, of, the, of, of our applications is, is within domestic on-site energy storage, um, where within the combined heat and power market for, for homes, um, where we store renewable energy uh, and have it as a seasonal energy storage. Um, in principle, um, here we, I would like to show you the econom economics of the, of the hydrogen storage. And in principle, hydrogen is, makes sense when a large capacity is required in terms of electric, electrical storage. Um, so we can see that hydrogen uh, and fuel cells is, is um, it's better in, in cost in terms uh, compared to, to the batteries um, and can beat them uh, with capacity starting from 150 kilowatt hours and beyond. So, so far from my side, thank you very much. So thank you. We continue right away with uh, Bjorn Simonsen, who's uh, Vice President of Market Development at Nell Hydrogen. Welcome, Bjorn. Good afternoon. So this is the Nell elevator pitch, or as I prefer to call it, the Nell elevator pitch. We've been around for a very long time. We've been around for 90 years. Actually, this year we celebrate our 90 years anniversary. That was when the electrolyzer activities in what is today Nell began. And they began big scale, as you can see. Some of the largest electrolyzer plants in history were built uh, almost 100 years ago. So large scale hydrogen is no problem. Since then, we have refined the technology that we today market in the industry, energy, transport business. And we're characterized by efficient, robust, and reliable electrolyzers. Today, Nell is a publicly listed company in Norway, about 13,000 shareholders. And we have offices in Norway, Denmark, in the US, and we have electrolyzers, as I mentioned, more than 850 units delivered to 60 countries. Soon we'll add a lot of numbers to that list. Fueling stations, we've mainly delivered in Europe so far, but recently we signed a contract with Shell in California, so we'll deliver uh, several stations to the development ongoing in California as well. And we also have a solutions division, which 
bind together knowledge and experience from both of other divisions with renewable energy knowledge and makes uh, entire fueling networks tied up to renewable energy sources. I had a chat a little bit earlier today about fossil parity. Fossil parity means hydrogen becoming as cheap as the fossil alternative and in fact cheaper as well. And that is within reach with our technology. Already in the transport sector in several places of the world. With the electricity prices you see here, the grid price in Norway is actually lower than four euro cent per kilowatt hour. But with that price and with a 70% utilization of the technology, hydrogen today beats gasoline by far. And with the technology development we have going forward, keeping the electricity price stable, we see we will reduce another 30-40% from where we are now. It's roughly 5 euros per kilos. And that is with all investments included. The electrolyzer plant, the transport of hydrogen from the plant to the fueling station, the fueling station, and the margin on the hydrogen. The trick here is the utilization factor. Two years ago, I was also in this elevator pitch, and I mentioned the importance of the already existing industry. There is a huge market out there already, and we can start eating into that cake. And that is what we are now going to do. In dialogue with a big industrial customer, we have designed a 400 megawatt plant for water electrolyzers. This is with the existing proven technology that we have today. The only innovation here is balance of plant engineering. And that takes us down to a cost of $450 per kilowatt. Pam or alkaline? That's the question, isn't it? <laughs> well, we ask what the customer what his or her needs are. Then we recommend the electrolyzer technology which suits those needs the best. We have both. With Proton becoming a part of Nell, we have the leading uh, alkaline technology as well as uh, the leading PEM technology in our portfolio. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next up on stage, we'll be talking with uh, Dr. Hans-Jörg Fell, who's CEO. Have I got the wrong name? Uh, that was my list. Is You're here? <laughs> yeah, Hector, you're next. Um, uh, Dr. Hans-Jörg Fell, CTO of Hydrogen Pro. Welcome. Yes, thank you very much for this kind introduction. Today at the Hanover Firm, we are launching the world largest, the world largest and most performant electrolyzer. Lately, there has been a tremendous interest in renewable energies, an increasing interest in how to exploit renewable energies to secure the transition away from fossil fuels to sustainable, a sustainable energy future. And this is often done by power to fuel concepts. Almost all of these concepts rely on the availability of vast amounts of hydrogen, green hydrogen, at affordable cost. For this, you need large scale electrolyzers. And for decades, the industry has tried to improve and develop new electrolyzer systems. However, that's my perspective in vain. And there's a gap to be filled in terms of efficiency, pressure supplied by the electrolyzer, and today we are filling this gap. Hydrogen Pro, together with THE of China, are launching the world's largest and most performant electrolyzer. This electrolyzer is an pressurized alkaline electrolyzer 
supplying 800 normal cubic meters per hour. This is the name plate capacity of a single cell stack. And the hydrogen is supplied at 30 bar pressure. With this pressurized system, the system is ideal for renewable energy application with intermittent power or large-scale hydrogen application. As you all know, energy consumption is a key driver for operational cost. And also here, we are showing very attractive data. The unit is energy efficient with a power consumption of 3.8 to 4.4 kilowatt hours per normal cubic meter hydrogen produced. And this year after year after year, no degradation. A typical lifetime of our cell stacks is 10 years and more. Also, in terms of investment cost, we are having meeting new milestone in terms of competitiveness. Depending on, on the equipment you're choosing, you can get an 800 normal cubic meter electrolyzer plant from 2 million US dollars. And on top of that, you get oxygen for free. In our plants, oxygen is produced at 30 bar pressure and can readily be used for industrial processes. THE and Hydrogen Pro together are, I would say, world leading in terms of large scale electrolyzers. THE has been pioneering the market with the high pressure alkaline systems since 1994, supplying more than 300 units. So the technology is well proven. The system we are offering here, 800 normal cubic meters per hour, is based on proven technology. THE and Hydrogen Pro, we are supplying world-class electrolyzer plants and we are, in that sense, number one, also in terms of large-scale plants. If you're interested to learn more about our product projects, please contact me after this talk or join us at our booth C55 over there. Thank you. Thank you. So let me introduce briefly uh, Hector Maza business development at uh, GNR. Welcome, Hector. Thank you very much. Is it on? Yeah, OK, thanks. Thank you. I'm going to try to uh, wake everybody up. Uh, I'm going to go very, very fast through these slides, because uh, unfortunately, it's very hard to reduce the number of slides for me every year. So. Um, some of you already know Giener, so this will be just a review. We, you know that we are one of the largest, uh, what is this? Oh, next. Oh, oh. It's not. It's not. It's not uh, going forward. Okay. Thank you. So, uh, Guinea was founded uh, 44 years ago. We have been profitable for 44 years. We're proud to say that because that's a challenge in this market. Um, we also have uh, two merit review awards from the Department of Energy, DOE. I think we're the only company that has that, and we're very proud of that as well. We, of course, have a global presence. What's happening with the Giner? And you've seen our Giner logo here has now an addition there. It's called Giner ELX. Giner ELX was formed recently, about a month ago, and it's the spin-off of our electrolyzer division from the Giner Core. Giner Core continues to make laboratory and all kinds of uh, R&D research and development. But then you, there's a life sciences side to it, which I'm not going to get into. Just very quickly, uh, we are in the large hydrogen scale electrolyzer systems, rapid response, PEM, all the things that you've heard here before. I, I would like to say me too, but I think it's me too and then some. So let's, let's go a little bit through that. We we'll continue to do the legacy product line that we have done for so many years, maybe two decades now, in the uh, uh, Department of Defense, Department of Energy, NASA, et cetera. 
we, uh, we're going through, of course, laboratory hygiene, which is also a legacy product. We do thousands of units of this every year for OEMs in the UK and uh, mainly in the, around the world. Lately, we've been approached actually by a very large, much larger than the, than the existing ones to uh, conduct an actual uh, tenfold on that. Hopefully you can hear me, I'm sorry, holding it too low. Um, this is what you all care about, the core of the technology, the stacks. We've been doing this for a long, long time. I think we know PEM better than most people uh, around the table and uh, proudly so, we, we display, that, display that with a very high efficiency, very high flexibility, super fast response time. All those kinds of things we can talk in detail if you want to join us later on at the C36 right behind this uh, podium. And uh, these are some of the key accounts that we've been showing throughout the years and we continue to do business with a lot of them and we have actually take, taken a step further. Uh, you will probably know about uh, large companies like Abengoa which originally had a spin-off and created H2B2. Then they became also a partner going forward as an investor. Uh, we have a tremendous amount of uh, developments around this, wind uh, uh, coupled electrolyzers, on wind, offshore, onshore, uh, solar panels, all this in California has been a great difference in Germany as well. We like to continue this effort. This is one of the, uh, the, the, the one development uh, that five years ago won as the latest uh, um, Mary Review Award. This is what the trajectory means for our product line. We started, uh, as you know, very small and we still continue that uh, product line, but we go much larger now, up to one megawatt and then two megawatt stacks. Stacks and systems, we can be flexible on that. We can actually draw a line and say, well, let's make uh, one or two megawatt stacks up to 20 megawatts. And once we go to 50 or 100, we have to go with a five megawatt development, which is what we're announcing uh, very soon in the next uh, couple of years. A lot of the developments are now requiring 100 megawatt and inclusive uh, gigawatts uh, size to be able to reach those very aggressive pri uh, price targets that you've seen. We'll come to that at the end of the presentation. Uh, pressure. So I have yet to see the first company that comes up with 900 bar pressure out of an electrolyzer. We've done 350 bar directly from an electrolyzer. We don't recommend that's the best option. We go with 40 bar in the standard product offering. Then we go to 900 by electrochemical compression. Developments. Of course, in Europe, we have France, Mirt project. Uh, Germany, USA, hydrogen refueling stations, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. The new and latest developments are, of course, uh, in France, in India, and more in Germany to come. Um, I, I'm going purposely very fast to this because I know you can review it later. I just want to mention some of the things that we've done. 2017 and 2018 are big years for us because we're actually deploying not just the stacks but the full system for the multi-megawatt systems and then the full centralized plants. This is the goal: four dollars per kilogram. Uh, I know you like to talk about euros, so it's maybe 3.8, 3.7 uh, euros per kilogram. That's the goal. That would give us a real advantage over, over gasoline, and it will allow us to really transition over to the hydrogen economy. We can do this. That's a target for 2020. We have that, compromise, that commitment with the Department of Energy, and we'll, we'll, we have a way to get there. This is the roadmap. This is where we are today, standing in 2017. We're approaching very quickly to the multi-megawatt and gigawatt scale. We're ready for do, to do that with more than one partner. Many of the competitors here are also competitors. They actually work with us, whether they do Alkaline or PEM. We're, we're indifferent. We don't mind which is the right solution. We are flexible and we attend to that. These are some of the other systems and I just uh, want to give you a glance of what two megawatt looks like. 40 foot container, two megawatt solution, all inclusive. And this is, these are the next steps. Uh, with this, I'm, I'm about to conclude, but we're moving to a new facility which is solely dedicated to hi large hydrogen refu uh, electrolyzers. We're also moving up to the next scale up, which is the five megawatt stack, which is standing right behind you. And we are also focused very clearly on power to gas, power to product, uh, even power to liquid uh, products uh, today we learned. Very interesting, coupled with renewable energy. And with that, we have a private equity investments coming in online, uh, which we have always pushed away from. And now they're, they're actually participating in this kind of a cluster where we're gonna be able to bring large centralized electrolysis to the renewables, to the hydrogen refueling stations for mobility or back to energy. Next steps, here us to four. Four is a number to keep in mind. And with that, if you have any questions, we'll be more than happy to receive you at our booth right behind uh, this, uh, this podium. Thank you very much. Thank you, Hector. Please welcome with me Karsten Krause, who's managing director at Arifa. Um, H2Gen. Welcome, everybody. 
So let's start. Arava, Arava H2Gen, the PEM electrolyzer manufacturer. I want to introduce you first the activities of the Areva group in uh, the field of hydrogen. As you can see at the beginning, they have the hydrogen production. That's our company, Areva H2Gen. I will go deeper in uh, in a few minutes. So the next step is hydrogen storage. There we have uh, two companies going in, Areva GmbH, based in Erlangen. They go for LOHC projects and uh, solutions. And then we have the company EMS. Uh, EMS is based in uh, Germany, in Jülich, and in, in the Netherlands. And they go for, for type 4 vessels and the storage systems, stationary and uh, for mobility expli uh, uh, activities. Then we have H2Us. It's a Areva energy storage based in uh, Aix-en-Provence, going for a redox low battery. And we have H2 projects also under the uh, lead of Areva GmbH in, in Germany, solutions um, projects. And uh, one project, for example, the next solution is uh, hydrogen fueling stations, especially for applications like forklifts, um, trains, and uh, buses. So you see large scale uh, fueling stations with an electrolyzer. And uh, this we are going for the next projects, hopefully starting this year. So coming back to Areva H2Gen, we are a young company founded in 2014, but uh, we have a history of uh, altogether more than 25 years. So in 2014, it was a merge of a company CETH2 and Areva Helion. And um, so our shareholders are Smart Energy, the owner of CETH2, family-based uh, investment company, Areva as a second uh, shareholder, and the third shareholder is ADEM, this is a French um, agency, energy agency, so the venture, uh, venture capital of uh, the French state. So we are based in Les Olis, it's in the south of Paris, so there we have the headquarter and also our production, and we have a subsidiary in, in Germany. So in last year we built up a new production facility to build up uh, to 30, 36 electrolyzer. We have a 2.5 megawatt excess, so we can test our systems by ourselves. And um, yeah, so going out from there, you, see, you have a look to the production side. We have a research and test center inside, and this is uh, built up last year. So the, our product line, so we have uh, two product lines. One is uh, container-based uh, solutions up to one megawatt in, in a container, so plug and play uh, solutions. It's our e-light system. And uh, the next step is uh, this, we have a 15 and 35 bars. And we go also for multi-megawatt uh, solutions, especially for, for grid balancing, renewable uh, projects for chemistry refineries. So there we go also for yeah, new concepts. We just uh, presented uh, last yesterday our 60 megawatt project. This 60 megawatt project is based on a 10 megawatt module with a two megawatt stack, which is in the development. So this is a concept uh, for, the next, for the next years. These are the PEM electrolyzers. So we have all in one platform. So our benefits, flexible, plug and play, easy to use, cost efficient, simple, reliable, and safety and uh, efficient. Thank you very much. So next in line is uh, John Zagaya, who's uh, Senior VP of Engineering at Proton Onsite. Welcome. Good afternoon. Hello. Oh, thank you. Uh, good afternoon. I'm John Zagaya, again, Senior VP of Engineering from Proton Onsite. Uh, thanks for uh, uh, sitting in the audience today. Uh, just a little bit of background on uh, Proton Onsite. Again, we're exclusively PEM uh, electrolysis at this point. Uh, uh, founded back in 1996, so uh, actually celebrating our 21st year this year. Our headquarters, including our manufacturing, production, engineering, etc., are in Wallingford, Connecticut, have about 90 employees there. 
I, uh, and at this point uh, have uh, approaching 3,000 operating units over that 21 year plus history uh, actually oper operating in the field. Uh, in terms of our overall capabilities, uh, first and foremost at the heart of our system and, uh, and I think uh, our premier technology development is the PEM cell stack. Uh, we've integrated that into a variety of product systems and we also customize solutions associated for their end use uh, using those stacks and systems. Uh, we, order complete, uh, uh, we offer complete product manufacturing and testing. Uh, we containerize uh, and hydrogen storage solutions. Uh, and and uh, while we're proud of our cell stack technology, we're really a product-driven company at this point. So first and foremost to us is quality, reliability, uh, and performance that meets our customer and market needs for water electrolyzers. Uh, in terms of our product lineup at this point, again, going back almost to the origination of the company uh, from a product standpoint, uh, at one normal meter, uh, per hour uh, is our S series uh, on through single and multi stack units up to our offering uh, that we introduced last year, uh, 2016, was our one and two megawatt uh, building block platforms uh, with four cell stacks per, uh, per megawatt. I'll talk a little bit more about that uh, coming up. Uh, in terms of the underlying technology, if you will, what enabled that scale up uh, from the very small to the largest and the megawatt size is actually that core technology, that cell stack development. Uh, and it's worthy of note here at this point, uh, over, the, over the development history of those products, we've reduced the capital cost, so unit cost of hydrogen output uh, per dollar by 80%. Um, and we're confident that we can, we can improve uh, or, or continue along that line of trajectory to, to cost reduce those systems further. Uh, how did we get there? Uh, good basic fundamental engineering, uh, both at the cell stack level and the system level. Uh, extensive testing, again, both at the unit cell, uh, the cell stack, and then the system as well. So we have, uh, I say, a, a, a large number of uh, test stands uh, and prototype systems that we continue to operate to learn more about those systems uh, in terms of predicting what their ultimate performance is, uh, field failures, et cetera, and we use that as advice for subsequent designs. So a good heritage there. Uh, we uh, also, to round it off, to round it out, offer the global support uh, to our products. Uh, we have regionally trained partners. We offer on-site installation and training, and of course, a 24/7 call in line. Um, so you put all that together, and you actually see uh, the, I'll say, the the benefits of, of of the approach that we've taken to actually develop those products, which is uh, greater than one billion cell hours over that 20-year history across our product line. And I think again, that's a testament to our products and the process that we use to develop them. So where do our generators go? So on the left-hand side here is really, I'll say, our industrial market, power plants, laboratories, uh, specialty gas type process elements. Uh, we also do uh, cell stacks for the US and foreign military for oxygen generation. And on the right-hand side is the, I'll say, the new markets, uh, which have been discussed here as well, uh, whether it be the grid energy storage, um, some of the power to gas methanization, and of course, transportation. Uh, just a few highlights of those systems. Again, we've installed them all over the world. Uh, they're containerized, they're outside, they're indoors, so there's a variety of applications those end use, all using those same core products and technology to fulfill them. On the emerging market side, uh, likewise, a number of power to gas projects uh, that we have completed successfully, and as well on the fueling side, again, using our core technology as the fundamental part of that uh, system. The pitch wouldn't be complete about, uh, without talking about the introduction of our on-site, uh, our Proton on-site M-series, again, introduced in 2016 at both the one and two megawatt building block levels, uh, four stacks for the, uh, uh, for the one megawatt, eight stacks for the two. Uh, you can see it's packaged fairly compactly to fit into a, uh, a container. Uh, a few key features here, again, what it shares with a lot of the earlier systems, it's, it's full deferential pressure, so I'm op operating the oxygen and ambient pressure. Uh, actually reduces the complexity, safe, uh, increases safety, and reduces cost of the overall system. At the heart of it is our 250 kilowatt PEM stack, uh, which offers, um, again, redundancy in the event that you would have a failure, so rapid change out, and that has actually uh, paid dividends in some of our other systems uh, in terms of lessons learned. Uh, the gas management system is derivative of our earlier products. As I said before, it's a, it's a skid-mounted assembly that has flexibility for indoor and container applications. Uh, we also have uh, a new advanced uh, controls display with this uh, that offers uh, I'll say both load following uh, and uh, tank topping modes uh, to support a variety of M use applications in the field. 
Uh, and uh, last but not least on that, uh, as, as you're probably aware, we received an order uh, late last year actually for our first 13 megawatts uh, of that scale product. Uh, we are currently working on and will be delivering the first three of those uh, by the end of this year uh, with the balance of those to, uh, to be delivered next year. They'll be uh, into a, a bus fueling application in China. So in summary, uh, we look at Proton as the world leader in Pema Electrolysis products. We have over 20 years of uh, combined experience, uh, both on the technology and field. Uh, we've invested over the course of the company's history over $100 million in that technology development, which again, I think is paying dividends in terms of the overall performance. Um, uh, and um, I guess uh, last but not least, we're, uh, uh, we're excited about uh, where it is we're likely to take this with Nell at this point. Um, so we look forward, as Bjorn says, to be able to offer uh, the best solution to our end product in terms of uh, providing hydrogen. So thank you. So already on the stage, up next, uh, Dennis Tom, who's EU Regulatory Affairs at Hydrogenics Europe. Welcome, Dennis. Thank you. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, so I will uh, introduce you in five minutes uh, a little bit about um, Adogenics. Um, so uh, Adogenics, we are one of the unique company um, I'd say involved with two technologies, with uh, fuel cells and with uh, electrolysis. Uh, we have uh, three divisions. Uh, one is about um, uh, adogen production, one is about power systems, and one is about uh, renewable adogen. Uh, we are present in three countries. Uh, we manufacture the fuel cells in Canada, we manufacture the um, electrolyzers in Belgium, and uh, we have also a division in Germany. Uh, we have uh, delivered more than uh, 1,500 electrolyzers, uh, electrolyzers worldwide. Uh, we estimate that we have uh, 500 electrolyzers operating uh, at this point in time. Uh, we also uh, delivered uh, more than 2,000 uh, fuel cell uh, projects and we are uh, stock listed on the NASDAQ and the Toronto uh, Stock Exchange. Um, in terms of um, references, uh, we have uh, nice references uh, in the electrolysis uh, business. On top of our uh, traditional industrial uh, business, uh, we have, um, I would say, um, good business in hydrogen refilling stations. Uh, we have been involved in more than 50 um, hydrogen refilling station projects. Uh, sometimes uh, delivering only the electrolyzer, but also uh, more and more delivering the complete turnkey uh, hydrogen refilling station. Uh, the last one we delivered uh, was in Aberdeen, uh, which was uh, inaugurated uh, two months ago, a 700 bar uh, hydrogen refilling station. Um, we've been uh, a pioneer in uh, power to gas projects uh, with more than um, 15 power to gas projects delivered uh, mainly in Europe but also outside of Europe. You, I guess, all know the 1.5 um, PEM electrolyzer with Aeon in Hamburg, also uh, other projects with alkaline technology. Regarding fuel cells, um, uh, we have reached also the megawatt scale um, um, size with a fuel cell technology, uh, with one project in South Korea. Uh, we are involved in the uh, Alstom, Alstom um, project with hydrogen trains. We deliver the fuel cells to Alstom and also with the um, hydrogen uh, plane uh, with uh, DLR in uh, Germany. And we have more projects also coming. Uh, we just uh, signed a, a two megawatt hydrogen refilling station in, um, in California. It will be the, the biggest one uh, in the US. Um, we are also uh, get contracts about uh, two hydrogen refilling stations uh, very recently in Canada. Uh, we are building a five megawatt uh, power to gas project in Ontario, Canada as well. And we just signed a few weeks ago a 2.4 uh, PEM electrolyzer project in Germany uh, with uh, Brunsbüttel about uh, power to gas project. So really, things are going uh, good for us at the moment and really uh, a lot in the megawatt scale uh, type of project. Regarding um, electrolysis, as you uh, probably know, we are uh, involved with two technologies, uh, traditionally with alkaline. We have more than uh, 25 years of experience with the alkaline technology. We know it very well. And uh, we uh, started uh, 10 years ago uh, with a development program on the uh, proton exchange membrane technology. And there's been uh, many interesting developments there. Uh, three years ago, uh, we presented to you here uh, the 1.5 uh, megawatt cell stack, and uh, there has been uh, new developments uh, on the PEM technology. 
So basically, um, the main uh, improvement we have done, and this was uh, presented uh, this morning for, uh, for the first time, uh, is that we now offer uh, one single PEM cell stack uh, with uh, a peak power of uh, 3 megawatts, uh, able to produce uh, 620 uh, cubic meters of hydrogen per hour. So today, everyone was presenting about the largest uh, type of projects. I present you today the cell stack with the smallest footprint, which will be critical when we want to go to industry where you don't have the space to build these uh, huge projects. So I invite you to visit your booth. We are just there uh, on the left-hand side, and we will uh, explain you more in detail the features of this project. Thank you very much. So up next on stage is Dr. Frank Allerbode, Head of Research and Development at HTEC Systems. Welcome. Okay. Thank you very much for the kind introduction. I'm happy to present HTEC Systems uh, today for you. HTEC Systems uh, has a new slogan, and this is Hydrogen is Now. And I will come back to that uh, pretty soon. Let me first introduce you to uh, HTEC Systems. HTEC Systems was developed, uh, was uh, founded in 1997, so it's uh, also 20 years for us now. 20 years of experience in hydrogen uh, products, uh, starting with fuel cells, uh, but now we focus uh, on electrolysis systems. Um, the company is now uh, owned by GP Jewel. GP Jewel uh, is founded uh, uh, some time afterwards, but uh, it uh, increased strongly in numbers of employees. We have now 190, not 190 employees, um, and we have a focus on renewable energies. So together with uh, GP Jewel, we can deliver everything from planning a renewable energy plant, maintaining it, um, making all the financial uh, um, aspects on it, and uh, with HTEC system, we convert we can convert the renewable energy into hydrogen and uh, also we electrify it or um, make the, the basics for uh, using it in indus industries or wherever hydrogen is needed. Um, I come back to hydrogen is now. Um, often people say hydrogen is the future, but if you look around, hydrogen is uh, present. Hydrogen is really now. Uh, hydrogen can be stored into the natural gas grid. It can be used in different uh, industrial applications. Um, we see a lot of fuel cell cars running around, so you can use it for mobility. Um, you can use it in the chemical uh, industry and uh, the, in the future, hydrogen will be used for energy balancing, for energy storage, uh, for renewable energies in really large scales. So hydrogen is now and that's good. Um, let me tell you something about our product range. Um, we are happy to uh, present uh, two products uh, this year, which are um, uh, ready to sell. The first one is the HTEC Series S. It's a small scale PEM electrolysis stack um, from 10, 30 to 50 cells uh, with a power range of uh, 1, 3, and 5 kilowatts, uh, producing up to 1 norm cubic meter of hydrogen at 20 bars. Um, we've put a lot of development in the small stack. We learned a lot, and uh, within the last years, we could uh, get a uh, experience of uh, more than 100,000 uh, hours uh, in total of operation and we haven't seen a single uh, failure in this time neither we see any significant degradation so this is a really reliable stack that can be used in the industry for different purposes and uh, the good thing is it's available you can buy it um, all the experience that we made with our small stack we put into our new megawatts stack and uh, made one electrolysis system around it. It's called our new um, ME series electrolyzers. Uh, electrolyzer, you can uh, also see it on our roof. Um, it's the ME100 slash 350. It produces 100 kilograms of hydrogen per day and has a, a peak power of 350 kilowatts. Um, what more to tell about it? The load range from 20 starting already from 20 kilowatts going up to 350 kilowatts as I mentioned and um, the nominal load is uh, 225 kilowatts. What's pretty new, we give a guarantee, a performance guarantee for this uh, 
very uh, efficient electrolysis system of four years. So you don't have to worry if you buy our electrolysis system four years in guarantee and it comes together with also a contract for maintaining the unit. Data sheets for both systems are available at our booth and of course online and I would be very happy to um, welcome you at our booth at C58 right left to us. Thanks a lot for listening. So, and uh, uh, last but not least, our next speaker, uh, Nils Aldag, who's CEO at Sunfire GmbH. Yeah, welcome. Okay, thanks a lot. So, a uh, question was raised early on whether it should be PEM or alkaline, and obviously my answer would be solid oxides, <laughs> if you ask me personally. Um, but I'm perfectly fine with letting the customer decide, and I'll tell you why we can do it quite well. Uh, so we're a developer of high temperature or steam electrolyzers, also known as solid oxide electrolyzers. Um, the three core USPs of our technology are, first of all, the efficiency of the technology. Unlike regular electrolyzers, we can work with steam, and by that significantly reduce the amount of electrical energy that we need to produce a norm cubic meter or a kilogram of hydrogen. Here you see our efficiency that we have measured in, in real projects, uh, an efficiency of 3.7 kilowatt hours per norm cubic meter, which translates into 82% efficiency calculated on the lower heating value. Unlike PEM and alkaline, we are carbon tolerant. Um, we have a membrane that lets oxygen trans uh, or go through the membrane and therefore um, can not only electrolyze steam but also carbon dioxide in the so-called co-electrolysis, which is another stream, a, pro a product development stream that we are following. And uh, the third one, which might be surprising for you, is that the SOEC is actually more flexible than you would believe. Today, uh, we are operating our systems between 30 and 125 percent, and we believe that um, we can also idle our equipment for, for many hours and therefore offer some flexibility with the technology uh, where pe of which people believe that it's not possible. Um, in terms of prices, um, we believe that by 2020 we can be competitive with the demands in the market, for example in refineries, in the steel industry, but also in power to gas projects. Um, we have here a simulation of a business model where we assumed 1,500 euro per kilowatt electrical input, which translates into 1,800 euro per kilowatt hydrogen output, which I, sh which I think is the more important value. Uh, we have assumed 60 and 80 euro per megawatt hour because we believe that electricity, renewable electricity, will never be for free. You will always have to pay the costs plus a margin for the windmill or the solar power uh, plant operator. So we calculate with high values and we can do it because we have a good efficiency. And in this model here we have assumed 5,000 full load hours and a 9% IRR and we see that we can reach hydrogen production costs of uh, less than five or less than four euro per kilogram with our technology. Um, this is not the total production volume of our company. It's more to show to you how we are trying to commercialize the solid oxide electrolysis. We have started with cell and stack tests in 2012. Uh, we had our first 10 kilowatt project in 2013. We have then, uh, together with Boeing in the US, um, increased the, the installed capacity of our system to a one, or of our module to 100 kilowatt, and have sold two times 100 kilowatt to Boeing. Uh, together with Salzgitter, a German steel plant, we have increased the size of our modules to 150 kilowatt, which is our current module, which produces around 40 norm cubic meters of hydrogen. And um, we have sold this year to one of the largest automotive companies in Europe, a uh, 300 kilowatt system. And for the SOEC, we are planning our first megawatt project in 2018 with an oil and gas company. And then on the bottom part, you see the co-electrolysis development, which has started um, properly in 2016 and will be increased to 150 kilowatt by 2018 if everything goes well. Uh, last slide, because I've been asked to hurry up a little bit. Uh, this is the next generation electrolysis that uh, we will start delivering by beginning of 2018. It's a 185 kilowatt module with 50 norm cubic meters of hydrogen uh, production per hour. And we can put up to four 
modules into a 20-foot container, which brings us up to 740 kilowatts or 200 norm cubic meters per 20-foot container. And with this, I end my presentation, and we're also very happy to receive you at one of our two booths uh, here at uh, the Hanover Fair. Thank you very much. So we're going to overload the stage. See if it uh, sustains uh, all the professionals, the hydrogen, uh, well, I should say the electrolysis community here. Um, everyone who's if they could join us. I'm just going to offhand hand a microphone so that we can pass this around. It is impossible, even unkind, to try and motivate a controversial discussion with 10 people who seem to get along. Um, and uh, it's, there's a humorous side to this, of course. There's lots of cooperations. We know each other. Uh, we've been here for quite some time. But there are debates to be had. Um, and there's interesting takes on technology. Sometimes when I hear a single category, for instance, Dennis, Dennis mentioned uh, the footprint. Um, issue, okay? Depending on what applications, and for those of you who have scalable models, you can be indifferent to the applications that you, you don't need to mention them. That's up to the people who buy your commodities, or you can be large scale, and some people are very, very um, forthright with how big the market could potentially be in the coming decade. Uh, even in the coming years. So if we start with the small scale thing, where is it important, for instance, to have a small footprint? What applications are you talking about? And how large is the market there? I'll give a very practical example. Mm -hmm. uh, it's about power to refinery. As you know, there is a huge uh, need for hydrogen in refineries. Mm -hmm. And there are more and more talks about, um, let's say, producing hydrogen in refineries with renewable power. And in refineries, you don't have a lot of space. What is the potential uh, in electrolysis? We're speaking about 100 megawatts of electrolysis in several refineries. There have been some studies showing that the potential in Germany was about one gigawatt of electrolysis with refineries. So yeah, definitely there is a huge market potential. But what is missing is the reg regulatory framework. Mm -hmm. OK. Um, uh, we had the sort of the, the, the solid oxide electrolyzer is <laughs> the exception to the rule um, this time around. Um, uh, many of you talked about the response time. And uh, depending on what you're trying to do with these devices, response time can be key um, uh, when you're recuperate um, renewables as they rise and fall, for example. Uh, so um, how important is the response time? And I think the response time was mentioned by so many people. Let's take Niels, um, uh, who uh, at the end of the talk mentioned this. And then we'll go through, I'm sure there are many takes on this. How fundamental is it? Um, uh, and maybe it's not important for some uh, models. OK. Um, so I think, first of all, the purpose of an electrolysis is the production of hydrogen. And, and that's firstly what we have to make money with. If the business model doesn't work with producing hydrogen, it's going to be difficult, especially with the current legislative situation. Um, so we, in our opinion, you have to be able to buy renewable electricity at prices that make the windmill or the solar park owner happy, transform that into hydrogen and have a business model. And then I think um, there will be uh, also money available for people who offer flexibility in the market, um, but from our perspective, it's an add-on to our business model of renewable hydrogen production. So, so we, we've had a lot of discussion about the capital cost of equipment. Um, actually, when you look at a model uh, of how you make hydrogen, then you get low-cost hydrogen, low-cost electricity. That, that's, you're tolling energy through from electricity to hydrogen. You need high efficiency, okay, you need a low electricity price to get a good price for your hydrogen. The reason you have rapid response is that you get a capacity payment for being able to turn on and off rapidly. And that capacity payment and the action payment with grid balancing reduces the effective cost of your electricity which means that your revenue model is better for producing hydrogen. Okay, that's the reason you need rapid response. And I mean, classically, um, uh, alkaline 
electrolyzers are slower response than PEM electrolyzers and solid oxide is even slower because it's at higher temperature. And I do agree that there are applications where you put the right electrolyzer in the right place. Our emphasis is on grid balancing, energy storage and rapid response. May I just one quick, uh, quick thing on that because we're exactly in the same boat. Um, I would say two things to the two questions. Current density, which gives you the small footprint, and rapid response, milliseconds. We're talking milliseconds from 100 to 5% or from 5% to 100. That's what PEM can do. Uh, I cannot speak to the other technologies, but that's what we can respond with. So <clears throat> I think the bigger the, bigger the uh, source, the electricity source is, the bigger the wind park, the bigger the solar farm is, the less important the really rapid response on each individual electrolyzer is. So I think for the, for the big systems where we believe the future lies, the, uh, the really, really quick uh, response time is not so crucial. And we will combine also alkaline and PEM electrolyzers to make the optimal uh, solution for the different, uh, different customers, depending on, on uh, the level of grid connection and, uh, and also uh, the, the type of renewable energy. If you, could pass, if you could pass the microphone on. Yeah. Yes, I would absolutely agree uh, with Bjorn here that for large scale plants, the uh, requirement for, for scaling up the production, wrapping up the production immediately is, is less pronounced. Uh, however, <laughs> just a comment to you, Graham. Um, alkaline, it's, a, it's, a, it's not co uh, totally correct. Alkaline pressurized uh, systems have exactly the same response time as shown uh, with PEM. So here also the PEM, the alkaline electrolyzer system offers a good alternative. And then uh, maybe that what was your next question. At the end, it's the electricity consumption that, that uh, really matters. For large-scale production, if you consume 20% less electricity as you do with alkaline, then, then the economics uh, tell you which system to choose. If we, we've got two potential responses. Only one, yeah. <laughs> so, in addition to all the things already said, uh, as a pen manufacturer, for us, it's so this rapid market is an add-on as you mentioned and for that also it's very important to have uh, the, the possibility to have an overload only if it's a few times a day up to 200 percent and this is possible with PEM. So. I think we need to distinguish two different markets. One is uh, grid balancing, connecting to the high voltage network and modifying frequency, in which case there's straight rules, one second, two second response time. In the UK, enhanced frequency is one second, all the way on and all the way off. And you can't do that with alkaline electrolysis. You can modulate it, you can't go all the way on and all the way off. The other market is taking the electrolyzer to the renewable, which is an intermittent power source. And I would agree, it's less, the response time has less of a requirement under those circumstances. But if we're using the grid and we're talking about grid balancing, then the rules are straightforward. It's one or two seconds all the way on and all the way off. And that's where you get the payments. You don't get grid balancing payments by connecting directly to the renewable. What you get is credit for making a renewable hydrogen. But it doesn't improve your revenue model. In fact, it makes it worse because you have the load factor of the renewable. So if you want high load factors, high grid balancing payments, you connect to the high voltage network and you bid into availability payments that exist from the network operator. I, I don't want to beat on, 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 on alkaline because I'm not an expert in alkaline at all. But what I know about PEM is the fact that we do run 10 to 15 times higher current density, which makes it smaller, where the footprint is a premium as well. We're talking just about the refineries and you don't have a lot of footprint when you're going with one gigawatt. I can only envision what that would be with alkaline. I think there you would need to have, as, as, as we already uh, agreed, maybe the PEM solution would match that market. In some other markets, maybe alkaline is going to match it better. I think we both can run at 99% efficiency if we reduce the current density enough. But when we go to the highest current density we can, we can produce, let's say at 80% 80, 80 efficiency, we're running 3,000 milliamps per centimeter squared, not 300. And that makes a big difference in the, the size that you're going to be dealing with in the footprint. 
And Bjorn? Yeah, just one comment on the, the refinery part, because I don't think all refineries are very, very constricted in space. Uh, the ones we are talking to, they're more interested in the cost. What does the hydrogen cost? Is it competitive with steam reform natural gas? I mean, that is the most important part on the And if it is, they will find place for it. So we have, we are in dialogue with several uh, refinery uh, players which are interested in, even in alkaline uh, electrolysis, which has a higher footprint, but for them, it's the cost uh, that it comes down to. And not just cost of buying the electrolyzers, the real cost is not having them running. So the, the, the technology needs to be really reliable, proven, and it needs to be a no-hassle operation for the customer. In terms of footprint, most of the refineries that we've been talking to have actually quite a large um, the, the real footprint issue is putting an electrolyzer on a forecourt to make fuel. That's, a, that's a, 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 an important footprint uh, um, application. But it's the revenue model is the most important thing. If you can access grid balancing payments, reduce the cost, you can compete with, with Reformate at a refinery. Were you going to add to that? Well, I can always add if you want, <laughs> but, but maybe we can move to the next question. Well, uh, there's so many questions to address here. Um, I wanted to return to categories. Every once in a while you heard and you think, oh, just a minute, did the public notice that? Someone said fossil parity. Fossil parity, okay, so this, is sh this should blow our minds a little bit and then we return to this because this, this, is, this is a discourse changer, okay? When we're talking about grid balancing, we're talking about adding uh, where necessary uh, at peak demand, for example, but just a minute, when we're talking about storage, we're talking about the North Sea, these are like terawatts, gigawatts of energy, and uh, we're not talking about, and I have understanding, everyone has a business model, if you're supplying an industrial gas, it's necessary, that's lovely. But the thing is, we are shifting different um, discourse to some extent when we say, wow, renewable energies are unlimited, um, and when you reach um, uh, fossil parity, Okay, now this is a big term. I want to break this down. We can produce hydrogen. What do we do with it? Already we have renewable energies and we're shutting down the lines. This is slowing down the development of renewable energies. It has a direct environmental impact. This is important stuff. Okay, if you can harvest that energy in the form of hydrogen, what do you do with it? I think I heard once the word methanization. 10 people, yeah. <laughs> Once the word mesonization, and then on the other hand, I heard putting this energy back into the natural gas grid. A lot of people are against that as a sort of least effective way of using a relatively expensive, is, you know, what are the alternatives? This simply because um, it's what we can do. It is a storage facility. We have a huge natural gas grid. It can hold terawatts of energy. But you see what I'm going? You people have technologies with a growth potential. I see no storage facility as large as what you can do. Okay, so let's start with the, um, uh, what you said, methanization. Is that what you can do um, uh, to make the best out of these technologies and also to expand your market potential? I, I doubt that, it is, that this is the best way, but it's one way. And uh, if we just think we have so much uh, renewable power in the future, it's, it's even more, which is uh, excessive. So nowadays in Germany, many wind power plants are shut off. And of course, then we build some electrolyzers um, for mobility usage. But maybe there is a situation when the tanks for the mobility is completely full. So should we then switch off our, our electrolyzer or should we put it into a natural gas grid? just then we have at least uh, a small amount or a small amount uh, stored, but we can use it. And there's just a need for, for educating the people that this is not a really a safety issue. When you look back in time, a few decades, we had like 50% in town gas uh, of hydrogen. So yeah, but um, when I also come back to the questions before about food print, um, I think you mentioned reliability, which is, in my opinion, much more important as the, the food print. When we have uh, fueling stations now available, but uh, they're only available like uh, 20 or 30 percent, this could be really a disbenefit for the future. If people think, okay, there's a fueling station, 
it's always always switched off. So it's it's more important, in my opinion, uh, to have it reliable as a, to have a very small footprint. Okay. Yeah, if I can comment on the on the question uh, about uh, what do you want to do with the hydrogen, I think the first answer is mobility. Really, the most elegant way to use hydrogen, and there is a huge challenge in the transport sector how to decarbonize it. That's first. Second, it's industry because they have already the existing infrastructure co to consume the hydrogen, and we can go large scale very quickly with the industry. And then you start to think about other applications. And Probably methanation is the last thing you want to do. If you don't know what to do, then you will dump it into the, um, uh, the gas infrastructure. But the problem is that then you compete with the price of natural gas, which is extremely cheap today. So without regulation, it makes no sense today. I know, John, you're going uh, to jump. I'm going to interrupt you here, but I just wanted to add Marcus Royce, who's from Ulich. I had him on the stage. He did the number crunching, and his opinion was um, running cables to the south of Bavaria to get the wind energy to the south doesn't make sense. Um, adding it to the grid also doesn't make sense. His argument is to put a hydrogen pipeline from the north to the south of Germany and use it to fuel buses. Um, Maybe in the future there'll be a larger market for automotive things, but he says right now that is the most cost-effective application, um, and it helps to alleviate the accumulation of uh, Feinstaub, the, the worst type of uh, uh, diesel pollution in the city. Sorry, John, I interrupted you. No, just to back up with that last question, I think what you've heard here is that there's such broad utility for hydrogen as a fuel, as an industrial process gas, that there's plenty of opportunity to, I'll say, source uh, that excess capacity uh, in renewables with generated hydrogen to support the varieties of ap these applications, which, which just adds to the value proposition associated. I think just think we need to be aware of what that is and then focus on what those associated priorities are as we move forward. Uh, very, very, very quick comment on that. I, th I just, I, th I think having too much bias on what to start with first is not something at least we should do, the other side should do it, the customer side. And I think things won't happen from zero to one. Uh, it's not our responsibility to put from one day to the other 100% renewable energy into our gas grid. Uh, in Germany there's models where people are very well willing to pay a higher price for five or 10% of a renewable gas which is added to the fossil gas. And I just want to say I would, um, wouldn't be too biased on, on what's going to happen there. Um, most of those applications have good chances to be successful. And uh, I know uh, Graham's going to jump in right here. I'm not being negative on this, but there is a debate, and that's for me interesting. But it's important not to be agnostic or indifferent to this. Why? Because these are your business models. Ladies and gentlemen, in the Netherlands, um, they were putting 10 to 15 percent of hydrogen into their natural gas grid in the 20s. Okay, so if they could not use the, um, the, the hydroelectric industry, it was generated with water, if they could not use that, they were doing this in 20s. Now why have they, they, they've outpaced us in the 20s. Um, and there's nothing wrong with doing that, but there are limitations. Graham, we had this debate last year. How much natural hydrogen can you put in a natural gas grid? Is it effective? I'm sure you, you've got a comment on this. <laughs> I mean, the, the place to start is to say, you know, we've got, um, a couple of massive energy networks, one's electricity, the other's gas. It's incredibly difficult to decarbonize heat. Okay, one of the ways of doing that is hydrogen. Also, it's very difficult to store excess intermittent renewable power. You combine the two together and you have power to gas. And people say, well, isn't it higher value in transport? Actually, what you do is you take on the power to gas model, which is huge volume. You get your cost structure from doing huge volume, and then you've got low cost hydrogen for everything else. So you take the biggest application first and get that right, and then everything else follows very easily. Bjorn? So, from a NEL point of view, we are very supportive of all these. Uh, different markets that are now evolving. I mean, uh, so putting hydrogen in the gas grid might not be the best thing to do with hydrogen, but still it, it represents a huge market. So we find that very interesting and we support that. But from our point of view, we're competing against fossil hydrogen and fossil fuels. The day we crack that code, that's when it really gets fun. And what can we do? 
well, we can look at how do you create hydrogen in a fossil world. You use steam methane reforming. OK, so what's the capex of steam methane reforming? That's your target. That is our target. We see that we can beat that. So then the second tipping point that needs to be in place is the price of the electricity you use to produce that hydrogen. And we see some places in the world that price is already there. We're chasing th those opportunities to outcompete uh, fossil hydrogen on a general basis. And then, of course, these other markets where you uh, have and you mix hydrogen into the gas grid, etc., transport sector, those are all really good and will become huge as well. But the fossil is, is the most important. This is you, you want to stop fracking, first and foremost. <laughs> we, we want to stop fracking, first and foremost. I'm sorry, I'm confident in the US. We frack over there. We don't want to do that. Natural gas, it's extremely cheap. If you think it's cheap here, take a look at the other side of the Atlantic. You, w I think you're completely right. We have to, first and foremost, meet the challenge of fossil fuels. I think we can do that today. We don't have to wait 10, 10 years. We can do that right now. Because if you're trying to travel 100 kilometers with one kilogram of hydrogen, try to travel the same amount of gasoline, we can meet that. That's not, that's not even in discussion, I think. The problem is, as long as you have this available methane gas, of natural gas, at a very, very cheap level, the last thing you want to do, and I agree with some of, the, uh, of our, my, my uh, colleagues here, is to throw it in there. It's just not, a, not valuable to do at this point. Uh, Hector deserves a tree hug for uh, saying, uh, I don't like fracking, so <laughs> take my hat off to you for that one. I'll give you that tree <laughs> hug as well. Look, the two tipping points, you mentioned no-cost electricity, and I agree, that's important. The other one is the world is not valuing carbon. We're trying to decarbonize the gas grid and transport. Okay, so everyone's talking about the cost of methane. Okay, so the cost of methane could go to naught. Uh, is the world going to value the carbon molecule and say, I have a way, a route to a fuel with zero carbon in it compared to uh, fossil fuels? So you're right, we need to get to fossil parity. But we're also the other side of the equation is everybody looking at what value they place on hydrogen worldwide. That's, a, that's not a local thing, that is, that's a worldwide issue. Yeah, a uh, comment on that. Um, everybody is talking about decarbonizing our society, but little is being done, okay? For those of you who have paid attention, I did not mention hydrogen refueling in our talk. We are not targeting that market segment. Uh, apart from the transportation sector, the whole economy is driven by carbon, and I see little activity to replace that carbon. For us, we see... Um, way to store hydrogen by transforming it to, to X, to methane, preferably methanol, diesel, I uh, kerosene for planes, and I didn't mention that during my talk, uh, Mitsubishi, Tachi, Power Systems Europe, they have chosen us as a joint development partner to develop uh, such large plants, and uh, the attractive power plant especially up north in Norway and, and, and Sweden, make it very feasible to produce these kind of fuels at a competitive cost compared with black fuel, fossil fuels. I don't know where the microphone is going. Uh, uh, fossil parity, um, uh, when one listens carefully to how that is being discussed, it's a chameleon term, isn't it? Because it depends on how you use the hydrogen in order to achieve that. If fossil parity is achievable only because you're using the most optimal application for hydrogen en energy, then uh, you're right, Bjorn, we've got fossil parity. Um, if you're dropping into the um, uh, gas grid, um, uh, you might not look at it the same way. But uh, again, I return to the point that I understand there's a business model for the industrial gases. I understand that there's a grid balancing issue here. Um, uh, what interests me is um, uh, there, there is doubt and uh, skepticism about the way, but it seems to me is it not true that electrolysis and storage and utilization of hydrogen, for the time being at least, is one of the ways of harvesting the large quantities, 
renewable energy, and that right now there is no, there's not enough lakes up on the top of hills in Germany to do it otherwise. So the storage issue, is that clear for all of you? Do we have, a, like, are there people who are skeptical about that? Is that sort of uh, the lingua franca among these uh, 10 specialists? No debate about that? So it's only simply a case of um, how we do it, how we progress towards that, how we get beyond grid stabilization to uh, uh, larger scale applications. Whew. That's a huge step. That's a huge step. I have not heard that in this clarity in all the years I've been here moderating the discussion. Certainly not at last year. There was, uh, you know, shifting people. Everyone understands someone has a smaller, uh, simplistic business model, and there's room for all of that, of course. Um, but this is, this is for me, um, it's not news, it's sensational. <laughs> um, we've done a lot of uh, back and forth about the technologies available. Is there anything that we need to add here? We've covered uh, issues of storage. Um, we've talked a little bit about utilization. Uh, we've had the historical perspective, of course, because we have a, a long-term play. All your ancestors go back to um, uh, the first applications there. Are we missing anything on the debate? Air, uh, thank you. Graham said this, and uh, it, this is actually the, the, what I mentioned at the beginning. Um, there is a correlation between uh, traffic density and the incidence of cancer, okay? Um, and uh, why this bothers me is because although there's legislation in Europe, um, not so much in my home country of Canada, uh, but there's legislation in Le Europe in place which states that cars should not be driving on a number of days every year when the pollution is bad. By the way, the diesels are the worst, um, and it's because the diesel cars, not the trucks, are not equipped with the same filter equipment. But this is an important issue because cities are actually efficient places to live, and for the first time in history recently, anthropologists talk a lot about this, the majority of the Earth's population, where do they live? In cities. Uh, so. Yeah, just a brief comment to that. Uh, I live in Oslo, and uh, last fall, there was one day where you were not allowed to drive your diesel car. One day. And now the sales of diesel cars have gone down 30 to 40 percent. <laughs> Based on one day of, uh, of uh, prohibition for that. So it's, it's quite fantastic to see how people will change behavior based on, on you know, uh, one single foot in the ground like that. And it's also, of course, political initiatives that are important. I believe it's still the case that if you have an electric car in your country, in Norway, uh, you can tank for free. You, you, you can do everything if you have an okay. electric car, so th th pretty so much. This is, this, this is, um, this is uh, a part of uh, taking the initiative in that direction. I think it's wonderful. Uh, we're drifting backwards, yes? Okay. Yeah. So from our point of view, you, uh, you mentioned the, the um, diesel stop. For also in Germany, it's not like that today, so, but the discussion uh, started already, so in a few cities. And, but it's very difficult, and so f we see the mobility like electric cars, hydrogen cars, but yeah, you know, there are only a few today, especially in Germany if you have the big cities. So these uh, like like buses, and this could be uh, the first step. Like in our region in Cologne, and also in other cities, uh, we have heard here in, in in the UK or in in Oslo, we have a lot of buses, and this is a good um, way also to to bring the the clean energy into the cities. So if you have a fleet of ten or even thirty, forty buses, on one hand, and on the other hand, it's a good um, a good product to promote hydrogen or clean mobility, because if you have a bus, you know, it's more visible than a car, even if it looks like a usual car and it's not a Toyota Mirai. So we think, uh, especially the, the bus is a real good step. We have the programs from the FCHU, now with 150 buses, the next 150 buses will come to the European cities. And I guess this is a real good step, even for us, because they need fuel every day <laughs> and a lot of kilograms. It, it's, it's almost hu too humble a perspective here. If you're living in Berlin, of course, um, if you're living close to a street with a lot of uh, uh, traffic, if there are a lot of buses there, you actually pay lower rent. Okay, there's uh, restrictions on that. But the thing is, uh, one of the things we're not mentioning is not simply the air pollution, it's the noise pollution. When you see the hydrogen fuel dump trucks and the garbage collectors 
Um, uh, it is an urban environment. We know noise pollution is really a serious factor. In India, it's um, the cause of countless um, uh, 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 yeah, ailments uh, because it really is uh, detrimental to people's health. So, yeah, Graham. about air quality which has been adopted I think nearly worldwide it was an amazing piece of air quality legislation and it was simply people can't smoke in pubs you know public houses you used to be able to smoke and and you breathed in everybody's bad air okay today when I look at diesel cars uh, uh, at traffic jam, in traffic jams, pumping out diesel near people's houses with the window open, I think it's just analogous to smoking in pubs. And, and uh, the legislation can't be far off because the links now, if you take the analogy further, the cigarette companies had to pay for bits of legislation and also uh, legal suits against them. The car companies now know the effect that diesel has on people's health. It's very, very clear, and now that must be a risk to their balance sheets. And that's another driving force. Yeah. I think the discussion about the uh, pollution of uh, diesel or gasoline cars is, uh, is a really nice one, and it gives a lot of benefits to the hydrogen or the renewable energy sector, especially if you just um, make it a little bit more e ethical and uh, turn everything around. Just imagine we would have uh, all cars running on uh, hydrogen, but for the cost as it is now. And then somebody would come and say, okay, I invented a car running on gasoline. It's only half the price, but you will get cancer in the cities and you will kill the planet. No, none, none of us would do it. And imagine we would have done that. We have, would have all hydrogen cars. It would be way cheaper as gasoline cars because they're so much easier to build. So it's just, yeah, it's, it's not a matter of uh, if we are going to change the, the traffic sector to renewables, to, to hydrogen, it's just a matter of time. Dennis? Yeah, maybe um, one additional comment about a topic we didn't really discuss. Uh, I think we have proven today that the technology of electrolysis was there. It's mature technology. It's ready to be implemented, large scale, hundreds of megawatts. What is missing are the applications using the hydrogen. We are speaking cars, we are speaking buses, trucks. These are missing. How many cars do we have in Europe? Not enough today. This should accelerate. We should have European car manufacturers really promoting uh, hydrogen um, in, in, in mobility and buses. Uh, and I want to um, underline that the uh, FCH uh, will um, launch um, a new um, I would say initiative to gather all the cities and regions so that they can all together um, I would say, um, buy together equipment. It can be electrolyzer, it can be buses, it can be cars, really to, I would say, start the market and have more um, applications uh, requiring renewable uh, hydrogen. Björn? Just one uh, small comment with regards to cities, air quality, transport sector. I, I believe numbers uh, that we showed from Nell, I'm sure you can have more or less the same numbers for, from all the other producers here, that you can actually reach a fossil parity and go below fossil fuels in price at the pump. I mean, those numbers are important to take to the politicians, uh, cities, to car manufacturers, to show them that, hey, in these of the world, this is already competitive. You can launch, you can make a big launch of vehicles here because this will fly. Here are the numbers. I think that's an important message to, to start bringing to, the, to cities and, and companies. I think we can learn a page from the electric cars, because let's remember that the car is also an electric car. Uh, I think it was in Norway uh, that uh, they have already the legislation in place for, uh, in a couple of years, you can't drive a, a car that has internal combustion engine into it, into the downtown area of the city. And I think most of Northern Europe is starting to take a, take a look at that. You mentioned one day made a difference in Norway. Uh, there's some that every other day you cannot drive your car because the pollution levels at some level. I think China is starting to take notice and will have that impact as well. They say 10% of California's uh, air bad quality, it's due to uh, basically Shanghai and, and, and Beijing's air coming over. So it's not far away. It's just a matter of mentality. And yes, you're right, taking on the politicians and saying, we can do something about this. The technology is available. I mean, we've got the technology. Let's just act upon it with the loss and, and, and everything will follow. I reflect back on the time when I arrived in Germany, there were smog alarms in the 80s. Um, you looked at your license plate and you said, oh, I've got an odd number today so I can drive or 
I can't. Uh, these were in the 80s. At that time in the 80s, you had to have a catalytic converter in every automobile sold in Canada. You did not in Germany. Um, political initiatives have changed that. Uh, and it's standard philosophy among all parties, all Volksparteien, as we say here in Germany, that um, uh, the environment is important and this legislation is important. Um, and that one change made a fundamental change um, throughout this country. What I'm interested in is what changes could you anticipate? We're sort of running out of time here, but when we look into the future, Say we come back next year and we're all excited. I hope to see you all back here on stage next year. We're all excited about something that has changed to allow for more marketability. I hear again the vehicles are super important because this is, let's face it, it's where you can sell hydrogen at a good price um, and uh, reap a great benefit for the environment and you just need a little bit of legislation to move in that direction. But what potential changes could you anticipate, if I could ask all you to sort of give one or two sentences on that, what potential changes could be game changers for your business model and for our environment? Um, so I think there's two things. Uh the purchasing of electricity that has to be solved in a way that, that those business models can be realized. Um, but still satisfying the needs of the renewable electricity generating companies, that's, that's for sure. And the second one, we need to have uh, first doors opened. Um, let's take, for example, hydrogen in refineries is, I think, or to me, one of the big cases where we could open a door uh, that would create massive demand for electrolyzers and therefore run down costs. So I think um, if, it's, if we're talking about a one-year horizon, I think it would be a price for hydrogen in the gas grid that's the same worldwide, or indeed possibly just Europe, and also common uh, grid balancing tariffs from the electricity industry that would make hydrogen go crazy. From uh, my perspective, um, 2017 is an extremely important from the regulatory aspects. As you might know, um, the um, uh, European Commission has proposed a recast of the Renewable Energy Directive, in which today in the proposal there is a nice role for hydrogen. We need to make sure that this will enter into legislation and that by then it will be transposed into uh, legislation. And this will really be a game changer for all of our applications. I think, I think two things are, are necessary here. Of course, carbon credits are key. And I think we've seen it more and more happening and you can monetize that now in California and many other places. And the second is start looking at alternatives that you have not looked for. Uh, for example, we talked about refineries, but we talk about uh, CO2 emissions from a biomethanization plant. You have the met methane, 50% goes methane, 50% goes CO2. The CO2 you can actually capture and, and then turn into a long chain of, of, of carbons with the help of hydrogen. All these have a high value proposition and you can do that today. So you have to start widening at the same time as following uh, and pushing for the carbon credits and so, so many other applications that we can go into right away. Yes, okay. From my point of view also, I, I agree with the guys before, so that the refineries could be a good step. So we need a uh, change in regulation, that we have the green hydrogen in, uh, in the refineries. And on the other hand, I see maybe a growing market also in the industry to capture the CO2. So this could be start, it's a start in, in this year or next year. So also for a big issue for us, CO2 capturing in industry. Yeah, <laughs> I've got one. Uh, within this industry and within maybe also battery technology, you know, it's, you have this, you're pushing this flywheel. It takes much, 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 much longer than anyone anticipated uh, for, for many, many years until it certainly goes much faster. I think we are really, really close to the point now. And I think it'll be really, really fun coming back here next year to look at some of the really big projects that have been uh, started uh, in general. But I also think from a Norwegian perspective, you hear a lot more about boats on hydrogen next year. Yes, I do think that uh, the best catalyst for uh, electrolysis would be a change in legislation. For example, that uh, in terms of uh, excessive uh, renewable energy, uh, you're not punished for storing it. You should uh, gain some cents for each, each kilowatt hour that you store and we electrify later on. So this should be changed. 
And the, the other aspect we also discussed it is a, a CO2 tax or a CO2 trade. If uh, there is a real good a CO2 trade and CO2 becomes a value, then uh, we, yeah, we would be able to sell a lot of electrolyzers and maybe not be here next year on the stage because we are too busy. <laughs> yeah, and I think Bjorn said this. I think um, uh, successful completion or progress on a lot of the funded projects um, uh, increasing uh, public awareness and interest. I mean, this, uh, to some extent, the, the technology looks at, uh, at the outside as it's too costly, too challenging, and in fact that it's not. So again, success with the value proposition or the business case that makes it work, broader awareness of projects that, again, everybody's talking about here, but it's common amongst us, not so much on the outside. So I think having that success and, and publicizing it would be an important catalyst to, to moving beyond. From uh, our perspective, I think the key word here is circular economy. I think by next year, we will see more industrial projects where you try to uh, increase profitability by uh, combining hydrogen production with integration into other processes and to co-manage energy, um, um, material flows, and to have an overall optimization and thus reduce the overall cost. I'm pretty sure we'll see some of those projects by next year. From my perspective, I would see it same as the colleague here. We, we need some legislation on the storage side, uh, not to hinder hinder that one, uh, in order to 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 have the on-site hydrogen production and usage uh, um, supported. Um, and from, from our perspective on the lower scale of the, of the hydrogen production side, it would be important to ban the diesel uh, usage within the industry uh, or to, 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 to help hydrogen and fuel cells uh, on-site production and on-site usage um, within the industry. Thank you. We've unfortunately run out of time. They're waiting for uh, this location to be free for the uh, next event, but I want to thank everyone for their participation here. Um, we've been talking to Dr. Graham Cooley from ITM Power, um, uh, Siegfried Limmer, who's Research and Development at Odasco Heliocentrics, um, Bjorn Simonsen, who's VP Market Development at Nell, and uh, Dr. Hans-Jörg Fell, CTO of Hydrogen Pro, um, Hector Maza, uh, Vice President of Business Development of uh, uh, Gina, I always work on the pronunciation there. Um, Carson Krause, the managing director of Areva. John Zagaya, um, who's a VP of engineering at Proton Onsite. Dennis Thomas, um, EU regulatory affairs at Hydrogenics. And Dr. Frank um, Alabroad, who's head of R&D at HTEC Systems. My last comment on all of you people, you have immense reason to be proud of your technology. They are fundamental, they're important, and they are the future. Thank you so much for being here. I hope to see you all here next year.